We're on our way to get the inside story on a secret research facility. It's in the far north of Swedish Lapland, on the very edge of the Arctic Circle. It's 150 miles from the nearest town, but has been called the winter car testing capital of the world. For most of the year, Areoplog is gripped in a harsh winter. Between October and May, the temperature never goes above freezing point. The record low for this area is minus 52 degrees. This morning it's a relatively mild minus 10 degrees centigrade. But for the residents of Areoplog, the colder the better. Because as soon as the huge lakes that surround the town ice over, they become the perfect place to test cars. Areoplog is the size of Belgium, but home to just 2,000 people. During the winter test season, the population almost doubles, as engineers and test drivers from every continent come to see if their cars work in the most challenging conditions on Earth. They'll fine-tune the handling, check the reliability of the electrical systems, and perhaps do a spot of driver training. It all started back in 1973 when three local pilots cleared some snow off of Lake Hornarvon to make a runway. There were some representatives of Opal staying at a local hotel who went down and asked if they could drive on this new runway to do some brake testing. No problem, they said. And word soon got around that the folk of Aria Plog didn't really seem to mind what you did. Now, I'm told the ice is about one metre thick and can take a load of 22 tonnes. I just hope that they're right. Because later we'll be on the lake carrying out some extreme testing of our own. On the total control. Our plug's thriving economy is based entirely on car testing. There are some half a million hotel bookings a year, and the best accommodation has car parks where you can plug in auxiliary heaters. The Silver Hatton is where most of the car testers stay. There are Germans, Italians, Japanese, Rolls Royce, Mercedes, Toyota. But having expected the best test drivers in the world, there's a story in the local paper about the lady who drives a school bus complaining of all the prototypes skidding around the corners. But by and large, the locals ignore the prototypes, and it's that confidentiality which really attracts the car makers. The natives may see stuff five years before us, but they've learned not to be curious about the heavily disguised models. One of the major forces here are Bosch, who work with 34 different manufacturers. The things they've created here underline just how important the town is. Anti-lock brakes, traction control and the electronic stability program ESP were all invented here. Over the years, those systems have supposedly been refined, so we've decided to put each system to an extreme test to see exactly how much they can cope with. Well, I haven't come all this way not to have a play. First up, ABS, the system that prevents your wheels from locking like this when you brake. One of the hardest things for ABS to do is stop you on an icy hill. Without ABS, this happens. But with the latest ABS now engaged, will the result be any more controlled? Yes. Undramatic, but very impressive. ABS stops your wheels slipping when you're braking. Traction control stops your wheels slipping when you're accelerating. But will it work driving uphill? These huts shield specially prepared gradients of ice from the sun and are the perfect place to test. This is what happens when the traction control is switched off.
No traction control. No traction. Come on. Come on. All right. All right. I'll dip the clutch. Dip the clutch. Proper driving technique for ice. Very gently, gently. Gently. Gently, gently. Right, I'll take a right here. That's it. No matter what I tried, the front-wheel drive X-Type wasn't going up. But turn the traction control on and power is automatically restricted so the tyre's grip is never overwhelmed. The hill is conquered with no fuss at all. Nobody knew what would happen in our final test, except that it would need a large runoff area. To test the Electronic Stability Programme, ESP, we headed onto a frozen lake the size of central London. You could probably just spot me in the distance. ABS and traction control stop wheel slip in a straight line, but ESP stops you skidding sideways. Just 1% of drivers know how ESP works, yet I think it should be fitted on every car. The test is to try and swerve round one obstacle, then a second, and then a third. To begin with, we'll keep the ESP turned off. Right, I'm driving down a motorway at 70 miles an hour. I'm going to suddenly be faced with an emergency avoidance situation. I've got no ESP. And I'm sheet ice. I missed the first two obstacles, but after that, I was just a passenger. No control. And, uh, I just slammed into that, uh, fortunately, polystyrene wall. Normally, Bosch tests at 50 miles an hour, but this was at 70. And given that it was on sheet ice, I was doubtful that even the latest generation of ESP could save the skid. But we turned it on, rebuilt the wall, and tried again. Okay, now building up to the same situation, 70 miles an hour. I now have the ESP switched on. I faced the same hazard. I still can't believe this is going to work. 70 miles an hour. Miss one, miss the other, and, and just drive past the wall and gently bring the car to a halt with my ABS brakes. It's just so undramatic, it's unbelievable. The ESP senses a potential skid, so first cuts power, then applies individual brakes to counteract the slide. It reacts better than any human could. Watch how the front wheel automatically brakes just enough to keep you straight. It's easy to see why Mercedes reckon ESP cuts accidents by a third, while Toyota say by a half. Miss one, miss two. If the system works here, it'll work anywhere. And after experiencing it firsthand, I'm certain your next car should be fitted with ESP. Just remember, different car makers may call it different things, like DSC, VSA, or VSC. Without ESP, you risk a crash like this. And the thing you hit may not be so soft.